over to you. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about co-locations for lexicon building. Um, and simply, co-locations are what I like to call words that have friends, um, words that hang out more than you'd expect, a sort of conventional grouping. And that makes lexical collations a kind of multi-word expression. And idioms are also a kind of multi-word expression. But for the purposes, purposes of this talk, I want to distinguish idioms because they're non-compositional. Uh, a red herring is not red. It's not a herring. It means something else entirely. But when you talk about strong T, that's still T. You just have the word strong being used in a slightly different sense. And different languages are going to talk about strong T with different adjectives. Spanish uses loaded, cargado. French is, does use strong like English, so does German. Russian goes with firm. Shona, tihopu, or fat T. And Arabic goes with thakil, or heavy. Um, Sorry, William, could, could yeah. you uh, full screen that for, for the people on YouTube? Oh, I thought I was full screened. We're still seeing your, um, yep, give your me background windows. No worries. There we go. Thank you. All right. Needless to say, these are uh, troublesome for a beginner of a new language, because if you just go through and try to translate strong T literally into Arabic, you're going to get something that's going to sound like if I started calling strong T heavy T. And these are also trouble for uh, computer programs that want to help with translations. So enter meaning text theory. Uh, this is a, a very formal linguistic theory invented by Igor Melchuk and Alexander Zhulkovsky. Um, and they wanted to do computer translation. And they ran into all sorts of problems related to meaning. And they wanted dictionaries that captured co-locations and a bunch of other associations. And so they invented this notion of lexical functions. And this is just a notation to describe semantic relationships. It's a solution to a descriptive problem. And they have to be general. Um, for example, we have a lexical collation, collocation in English of black coffee. So that means coffee without added dairy products. There's probably no human language that needs a lexical function that means without added dairy. Um, and they did their work and came up with these charming Latin style names for the different functions. And there are about 60 of these lexical functions. I'm going to ignore almost all of them today just to talk about those that focus on lexical co-locations. This is from Latin magnus, meaning big, and it refers to any adjective that, or indeed any other kind of part of speech that adds intensity or a high degree or very um, to a word. And there are lots of these across different word classes. Um, and they appear to be extremely common in natural languages and people write entire papers about just this lexical function. So strong T, infinite patience, a heavy smoker, easy as pie, skinny as a rake. Notice that not all of these are just the same part of speech. You can say very easy, and that's just an adverb or as pie. So you're using a, part of a prepositional phrase to add your additional sense. Carefully prepared, strongly condemned. So we've got both adjectives, adverbs, adjectives modified by adverbs, verbs, even nouns can take um, intensifiers. You can laugh heartily. You can laugh your head off. Um, and this one I ran across, I just thought was interesting, a, a really big lie in Japanese is maka or crimson. The magnitude might apply to different domains and we've got a notation to express that. So intense experience in the temporal domain is long. Intense experience in quantity is considerable. Um, shortage can be chronic, and that's in time. And at the bottom here, we see that lexical functions can be modified. So anti just does like Esperanto mal, it turns something into the opposite. So the anti intensity of applause is scattered. Intensified temperature high, anti intensified temperature is low. 
This and a few other lexical functions admit degrees, so your cost can go from high to huge to astronomical. Uh, toll can be heavy or devastating. Um, often these differences um, are not just degree, but might have different uh, implications in uh, tone or register. Some are, might be more common formally and some might be more common informally. And that's true both for uh, degrees and just having multiple options, deep convictions, thorough convictions, strong convictions. But when you're coming up with intensity and a co-location for a particular word, you have to understand that many words have multiple meanings. So sick in the health sense, you can be very sick. You can be sick as a dog. But there's another meaning of sick that just means you're irritated or weary of something. I'm completely sick or sick to death. I'm like sick to death of comic book movies. Um, but you can't say that you're sick to death of cholera or you can't in my variety of English, it sounds a little tasteless. Um, and I can't say that I'm sick as a dog of comic book movies. So these meanings of the same word have different co-locationable possibilities. Look to a very close synonym of sick, ill, and that takes different words, deathly ill, gravely ill. You cannot be ill to death or ill as a dog. And I'm not entirely comfortable with deathly or gravely on sick, although a quick web search shows that there are a few people who will use that. Here's another complex lexical function with a modifier, the copula sense. Uh, some words have very specific copulas beyond just be, and then incep, which is in Chipper and writes to begin or uh, an encodative. And for sick, you can become sick, get sick, fall sick, take sick, but only for the first meaning. I cannot take sick of comic book movies. Ill has the same set of verbs, although I have in my own variety of English weird uh, tense restrictions. Uh, Took ill does not work for me, but taken ill does. So simple past no, perfect is fine. And then the sort of weary and tired sense of sick, you can't you know, take sick of comic book movies. So this is worth considering when you come up with um, co-locations uh, to think about what exactly you're collating, what meaning you're co-locating with. So using my own language, uh, Kielta as an example, I was thinking about sickness when I started writing these slides. So I had to think about um, how to have uh, deathly or grave sickness in Gilta. And the word os uh, already had associations with sort of entropy and mortality in the language. So just a dusty sick, oserinker, means deathly sick. And I already had luikin, which means heavy, um, as a max psychological intensifier meaning that you're uh, experiencing you know, difficult sickness. Uh, the same dust word that I came up with for deathly ill can be also be used in to refer to a desert that just doesn't have much life in it. And a few other random examples, aching humble, really humble would be lowly humble. Trite or sentimental is greasy for intensity. And for plague, os, I chose machin just because I already have machin representing sickness and coolness represent a recovery. So I just did that by metonymy. There are a few other conlangers I've seen talk about co-location. So I, I grabbed a few to get some ideas from them. Uh, Manala by Maya Comet. Uh, T is important in that culture. Uh, and we have yet another co-location for strong T is Y, Geno. And here the opposite or, or anti-intensity is thin, edam. So this is a common pattern in natural languages as well, where your intensifier and your anti-intensifier um, are natural opposites uh, in just naturally thin versus wide, heavy versus light, a strong T versus weak T. Uh, Moanala uses serial verb constructions often. And so for that to use intensity on verbs, it's a natural choice to use that already existing structure. Um, so fall down or stop plus fall down means come to a crashing halt. 
uh, run plus be awake means quickly. So this is an important consideration for ease of talk. I've just been using English examples and using familiar word classes like adjectives and adverbs. But if your language has different resources, you should use those. Uh, for example, both Hungarian and Dutch for these intensifiers um, have a love of compounds rather than separate adverbs and adjectives. Zeke, Fordsmender, Karyol has some nice examples. We don't have tea, we do have coffee. Um, and I appreciate him letting me butcher the pronunciation of his language. So strong coffee in that language is koronga, piquant or spicy. Uh, the same term is used for intense pain, koronga. Um, that's interesting, many languages don't have core root vocabulary to describe pain that only describe pain, um, but references to fire are common. So this seems allied with that. Um, and here again, we have a pair of uh, piquant for intense pain and a uh, baga for bland or insipid for pain. But the same term can also be used to uh, be an anti-intensive for surprise. Uh, in English, we can have strong tea, we can have strong coffee, we can have strong booze. But in Kariol, they chose a different term, tohpa, for strong booze. And it's also used for intense sounds or loud sounds, is to use heavy. So I'm going to skip away from intensifiers for a bit and move on to light verb constructions. Um, a light verb construction is when you get a perfectly good verb, like I walked to the store, um, is restructured using a verb plus some kind of noun. I took a walk to the store. Again, these are cross-linguistically very common. Just using decision as a, an example, we can make a decision in English, take a decision in French, meet one in German, give one in Turkish, and we can either do or put down a decision in Korean. Um, there's lots of papers about light verb constructions and why they exist. Um, it does seem though that there's more potential for modification with nouns in most languages. You can do things with topicality and focus. Uh, for example, I can say that I took a long meandering walk to the store uh, and it's not really comfortable to do that with adverbs. Like I wandered, I, I walked to the store longly and meanderingly, just doesn't work. Or another example is Alice patted Bob on the back. Alice gave Bob an overdue but well-earned pet on the back. There's just not nice ways to do that without turning your verb sense uh, into something that looks like a noun. So meaning text theory has this concept of pseudo predicates that's useful here. And it recognizes that many nonverb words have an implicit argument structure. So the, the noun investigation is clearly derived from investigate. And it has a first argument, which is the, the subject, we would think the person investigating. And a second argument, which is the thing being investigated. There might be other arguments that are obliquely represented. The argument assignments are completely arbitrary, um, but are identified in a meaning text theory dictionary. And the reason that matters is because some of these complex lexical functions reference different arguments to tell you what's going on. So here we have um, operare, to perform, do, make, or have, as a very common uh, kind of light verb construction to have. And here the subscript indicates which argument is the subject of the light verb construction. You can make a decision, can give or deliver, deliver a lecture, can carry out, etc. a search, have an idea. I can offer resistance or put up resistance. And that's from the standpoint of the first argument, which is resist. Um, and or I could meet or run into resistance, which is the person being resisted. So that's what these subscripts are indicating here. Risk, you can pose a risk or present a risk and the person who's being risked can run a risk. And then we have more complex expressions than simply verb plus noun. I can have control over someone or I can be under someone's control.
going back to that uh, start modifier, uh, you can achieve fame, take command, gain power, achieve victory, and so on and so forth. Um, or you can sustain an injury, suffer a setback, run into difficulty. Now in Kielta, I don't particularly need any light verbs that just do this. I can just take the normal um, oper, the normal uh, simple light verb construction verb, and add an affix that I have in the language that I use a lot to indicate something that is starting. But if you don't have uh, those resources, this might be available to you as well um, for something you can do in your own conlang. So here's uh, running away from uh, the light verb constructions because I have a little time here. Here's another uh, uh, function um, where you have terms that describe things that are as they should be, meeting the requirements, being you know good of their kind, a precise instrument, a convincing argument, uh, a plausible lie. That doesn't necessarily mean we're approving, but the law doing its job is one that's plausible. And these can be negated or made opposite as well, an unfounded fear, an obvious lie, and walk steadily. For Kielta, just as a quick example, I have a rather specific term, a sicaroma, which sort of refers to this synthetic haze that overlays reality generated by like PR and advertising and propaganda. And the term to say that it's doing what it's supposed to do is the verb grow. And the reason for that is that the ohm element and that word means earth. And so that's an obvious pairing. Uh, a good model is one that is kemin. It fits neatly together. They're unobstructed. And then this last one is a, a quick one here, a sort of conventional praise. Doesn't necessarily add much meaning refreshingly different, a bright future, a bright idea, a dazzling smile. These don't really add much meaning, but are still commonly found. And then we can have opposites that might produce an entirely new word, like a lemon to refer to a car that is not living up to standards um, or a rocky start. Um, I'll just note here, it can, from an analytical standpoint, it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish an intensifier from the verification one and the sort of conventional praise, but for Conlanger, it really doesn't matter a whole lot because we can do whatever we want. So I've skipped really quickly through this subject, but I think any Conlang aiming at natural should involve a hefty dose of co-locations, especially the intensifier ones. They're very common. Um, and I would think that after you get about 150 to 200 content words in your Conlang, um, Co-location thinking should be part of the, the process for new words. Um, and then lexical functions, I found a very useful shorthand for conlanging notes, uh, not just for co-locations, things like derivations, word relations, and exploring concept domains. And if you don't find the notation repulsive, too, too mathematical, um, I recommend uh, giving it a look. Um, I've set up a quick web page for this talk where I have some links to additional documents about these. Um, a few additional thoughts, um, but it includes links to all of the standard 60 uh, lexical functions, and you can play with those if you want. And that's all I have to say, uh, except for questions. Thanks so much, William. There's a, a couple questions coming in, in from the YouTube there. Uh, the first one was from Jasmine Scott asking about um, how this relates to amelioration of different words, like what about sick meaning really cool and i have to do a shout out to my my days as a teaching assistant for rap linguistics where we analyzed um words like or uh, lyrics from feral munch like literally the shit but having a positive con <laughs> connotation yeah for, for me i just see those as another example of polysemy the word has taken on a new contextually dependent meaning um you don't expect you know sick beats Right, you just it doesn't even apply because it's not applying to a human being. Like the 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 thing being sick is not um, animate. <laughs> um, so sick to death or very sick or deathly sick, none of those really make sense. Although it'd be interesting to see what uh, associated words because it, it's interesting to me that sick to death, in my version of English, cannot actually refer to the health meaning of sick, and yet 
sickness can lead to death. So there's an interesting uh, back and forth uh, going on between those two senses of the same word. So I, I could see those additional meanings of sick influencing other co-locations for like sick beats, um, but I'd, I'd, I'd have to encounter some of those in the wild. Uh, you, you kind of touched on this one, but a uh, question from Tony Harris, uh, I think right before you started talking about it, but how would you document this sort of thing in a conlang dictionary? Uh, for example, if Magan T equals thick in Alursa, uh, Magan Chala equals Gena, uh, I'm not sure what those uh, actually refer to, but what is the best way to record that for, for potential learners? Right. Um... Uh, two ways. I've not resorted to using uh, this notation in my dictionaries. Some people do. There, there have been dictionaries written this way. Um, I just include them in the article on the, like, the word. So I will say intensified with blah, 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 or reduced with blah, blah, blah. And always, always, always in my dictionary, I give examples. This is my obsession with examples, is to explain how collocations like this work. Uh, Tony just added to the uh, to the chat. Uh, Gena is is thick. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but uh, so, no, I think a lot no. of people in the YouTube uh, chat are, are very much in agreement with you on the the examples are key. Yeah. So thick. So we have yet another word for strong tea. Good. Um, from Kalesen, which I'm also probably mispronouncing, uh, what is a good book or a good place to start on, on learning lexical functions or about lexical functions? Uh, I have this uh, link here, and I'll dump that into different chat places shortly. Um, and I've got links to Melchuk's original paper. It's kind of intimidating because this is a very formal theory of linguistics. Um, but you can go through those and grab the ones you want. There are a lot of them that are derivational and they're just a super tight way to, to uh, make notes about what it is you're up to, I have found. Uh, and from George Corley, um, how might this relate to things like conceptual metaphors or to real world properties of the thing the word refers to? Right. So there's not... I have not found a lot of investigation about how particular words get chosen to be uh, co-located, right? Even for something like T, we've got a huge number of words, all, all of them indicating intensity in some way, strong T, firm T, loaded T, fat T. Um, how that choice is made seems very conventional in some ways. Um, in, I did use one example where uh, I, like with uh, the, the plague example, I chose hot um, because it's by metonymy, not necessarily metaphor, by metonymy um, with just sickness in general. Uh, but I, I would expect conceptual metaphor to play a role, but I've not sat and thought about that deeply. Uh, sorry, I ended your screen share, but if you wanted to share it again to show that exact example be a be my guess. No, that's fine. Okay. Uh, from Yoshimitsu, uh, quick question. What method slash program do you use to make dictionaries? I currently use Word, though I'm not sure it's very efficient. Uh, it's as good as anything. I use LaTeX, which is even less user-friendly than the notation of lexical functions for most people. Um, uh, yeah, I, I have long held uh, slightly eccentric, but strongly held opinion that dictionaries should be written with whatever you would use to write an essay. Uh, the needs of any given language dictionary are so complex that you can't write one program that can cope with all of it. So for conlangers, if you're working on multiple languages, I genuinely don't think there's any one tool um, that looks like a database that's gonna do what you need. So I just, I just have notebooks and then I, I write my dictionary the same way I write the grammar. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's, there's a few different ones coming up. Uh, Margaret suggests uh, she uses a spreadsheet and then imports into Wolf dictionary software. Right. Heard I, of I've heard of, I've recently learned about Wolf from Margaret, um, but I've not had a chance to play with that. I'm, I'm the same. I'm, I think, uh, closer to your end of things where it's still uh, 
spreadsheets, notebooks, and Word or, or Excel. I don't quite get to LaTeX myself. Uh, there are lots of uh, ideas coming up in the YouTube chat. There's an SIL toolbox, uh, Fieldworks 9. I think you're probably right that there's not one tool that's going to do everything, though. Um, I think I got everyone's questions so far. I'm just going back to double check. Oh, here's an interesting one. Uh, a comment from Sai in... Uh, I believe this is American Sign Language. The magnifier is to sign the thing slowly, which includes the sign for fast, though that can also be magnified by sig signaling it very quickly. Um, so are there, there are there other instances of these these double? I can demonstrate that. Sure. Uh, so uh, sign for slow is slow. This is just regular slow. Very slow is very slow. Fast this if you sign fast slowly and with a particular mouth signifier it means very fast although that sign fast quickly also means very fast but in general you sign things slowly i don't know if there's anything comparable in in spoken languages where you can have um quite opposite meaning magnifiers to do the same job. Yeah, I've not thought about that either. I can't recall any expressions, examples rather. Right, so I've dumped the link to a uh, sort of supplementary information in both YouTube and Sai will add it to the cutout for this speech. Uh, just because I'm not seeing another question yet, uh, Christine Schreier put in a, a plug for a survey on dictionary making. We, uh, they are curious about how conlangers are making dictionaries too. So um, please fill that in. Uh, I think at Fiat Lingua retweeted that request a little while ago. And so you can find it on, on Christine's Twitter or, or on ours. Um, William, thank you so much. I, I enjoyed that. And there's a, a whole rush of YouTube comments of people discussing the ideas you gave them if you want to check that out. Perfect. Everyone <laughs> should use them.